Mr. Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. This evening, Northern Ireland's women's national football team will kick off at 7 p.m. against Latvia in their World Cup qualifier. This uh, is after their tremendous success and their 4-0 win against Luxembourg on Friday. They truly are an inspiration to all sports people, but not least to young ladies who now wish to take up the sport. And it is encouraging, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to see so many young people being able to partake in team sports. Only recently, uh, in my own village of Bershian, there has been a new ladies team formed, Raceview FC Ladies. And their first training session will be held on the 24th of September, this Friday night. That in itself is inspiration to young people to get into uh, and involved in sports. And of course, there has been uh, ladies football teams in the North Antrim area, not least Bellamina United All Stars FC and of course Bellamina United Youth Academy. Uh, Bellamina, Bellamina Ladies have a youth academy too, as does Bellamina United. And they are bringing through young people, young ladies who are playing football uh, when they wouldn't have had the opportunity maybe 10 years ago and 15 years ago. So we should encourage it in this assembly. We should encourage team sports and make sure that it's financed properly and appropriately and support it so that young sports stars can flourish in the future. And I think the IFA should also consider the investment into this aspect of youth sports and ladies football. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Ms Gemma Dolan. Last week, what I believe to be a serious school bus driver shortage in Fermanagh was exposed. An invaluable provision for parents and pupils, especially in rural areas, has been running on a bare-bones service. The Education Authority and the Department for Education must do everything within their powers to rebuild and strengthen school transport services. Last week, there was a regular stream of parents voicing their concerns to myself and my office about the lack of drivers, which resulted in a number of buses not running at all. It's unacceptable for school children not to have their allocated transport to and from school available to them. It adds extra pressures on parents and school children that they can surely do without. It also adds extra pressure on the Education Authority District Transport Officers locally who are trying their best to run this vital service but without the required resources. I want to thank the Fermanagh based transport officers who answered my queries and communicated with me openly and honestly. I will continue to liaise with and to lobby the Department as to what options they are looking at to overcome these issues, both in the short term and the longer term. We need to ensure that this situation that Fermanagh families witnessed last week does not happen again and that school transport services are secured for the future. Mr Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I want to speak about the awful odour that is coming from the Mully Glass landfill site. The Minister last week talked about how the site is compliant and how extra gas wells have been added. But the fact of the matter is that the odour coming from the site has continued to have a massive impact on residents across Lisburn and Belfast. And it is fully across Lisburn and Belfast. I live in North Lisburn and the odour is smelling in my house up to four miles from that said site. The, the complaints that I have received personally have come from as far away as Finnegy Road North to the Bellside Road in Lisburn. Mr Speaker, that is almost a five-mile stretch, five miles where people's daily lives are impacted by the foul stench of rotten putrid cabbage. Surely I don't even need to ask if this is acceptable. I want you all to listen to what residents have told me about this smell. Just imagine living in these conditions, and I tell me if you would just sit by. When officials tell you there is nothing that can be done, one resident told me the smell lingers the whole way through the night, from about 2,300 hours until the morning when they left for work, and there it had been this way for months. This is the environment you have to try and sleep in. And if you do manage to sleep, you wake up with heartburn and the taste of this rotten odour, even with all the windows closed. I will leave you with the words of another resident that I think sums up 
very well what we all have had to live with. The odours seep into the house. They have been blasting to make the site larger, allowing more and more of the gases to get into the house. In the early hours of this morning, imagine that smell inside your house. The odour is indescribable. 14 years of complaints. 14 years of our family life being affected. 14 years of odour, both the smell of the decomposing rubbish and the smell of whatever they spray to try to cover up the stench of this uh, decomposing rubbish. 14 years of filthy roads due to the lorries. 14 years, Mr Speaker. It's a long time for the residents that live around that said dump. Will this Assembly take this issue seriously? And I will say to finish, Mr Speaker, the mountain is absolutely stinking. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr John Stewart. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I want to start by echoing the comments of um, the member for North Antrim, well, um, wishing the women's team all the very best for this evening, and also to mark, as a Tottenham Hotspur supporter and a football fan, the sad passing of Jimmy Greaves, MB at the weekend, who was a footballing legend. I just want to take the opportunity this morning to um, acknowledge and commend the work of the Eco Rangers, the Whitehead Wombles, and all those across East Antrim and across Northern Ireland that are fighting the war on litter. Many of you will have them in your own areas, and what they are doing is absolutely phenomenal. This has started off organically, many just doing it by themselves, but over the past 18 months to two years, particularly through lockdown and more recently now, they are organised by a dedicated group of, of um, volunteers who have now taken it from three or four people to scores operating on our streets and early in ways across our shorelines and beaches. And I had the privilege to be out again with the Carrick Fergus um, Eco Rangers at the weekend doing a beach clean in Carrick Fergus. And one of the um, organisers, Christine, told me that in the last four weeks alone, they have lifted collectively 600 bin liners of rubbish from East Antrim alone. 600 bin liners. It is phenomenal what, the, what these people are doing. And they're doing it hand in glove now, thankfully, with council in areas that are now able to be targeted and structurally organised. And I would just, like I say, put on record my thanks to Abe and to Ricky and to Christine and to all those organisers and all those volunteers who continue to do what they do. And I'm sure they're operating in many of the other members' um, areas here today. And if you could just um, give them the support and encourage councillors to do the same and to give them the grand support that they need to continue the great work that we do. We always say that we live here and we love here. And it's a lot easier to do it with these fantastic people doing what they're doing on a daily basis. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr Declan McAleer. I'll ask Ken Collier. Uh, members, I want to speak to, this morning about the labour shortages in the pig industry and the crisis that this is creating. Uh, we're, we're facing the potential crisis in the pig industry as a result of labour shortages as a consequence of Brexit and the very hostile immigration policy, British immigration policy, uh, which has made it very difficult uh, for agri -food to attract agri-food workers, and uh, many of the, our EU workers have left as a consequence of Brexit. And it's essential for the future of the agri-food sector in the north that we can continue to recruit and, uh, the, these EU workers. I met the Farm and Ulster Farmers Union earlier on this summer, uh, where they flagged up the crisis with me, and we've heard more briefings about it since. It's estimated there's about 25,000 pigs currently backed up on farms, which should be culled. And this obviously will have an economic impact on, on the farmers and the food industry, but also a potential welfare issue uh, for those pigs as well. And as we approach the Christ Christmas season, this will become even more uh, pertinent. As chair of the ERA committee, I have written to the, the British Home Office and therefore highlighting these concerns. We made a number of asks around uh, relaxing the immigration rules, extending the settled status beyond June, including butchers and uh, processing workers on the shortage occupation list, and looking at the possibility of compensation for those impacted by this crisis. Now, on top of this crisis, we have uh, in recent times become aware of a severe um, uh, shortage in CO2 here in the north, we have estimated we have seven to ten days left of CO2 in the north. And members will be aware that CO2 is vital in many industries, particularly the uh, poultry and the pig industries, for the humane slaughter of pigs and indeed for the uh, processing of food packaging. Now, there was actually a very bizarre exchange here yesterday in the chamber when my colleague Jerry Kelly raised this with the economy minister, and the economy minister said that this was not pertinent to his department. Now, I, I can't understand how an economy minister cannot work out that the shortage of CO2, which is so crucial to various industries across the north, is not pertinent to his department. And I think that that is crucial, that he needs to 
to go and reflect now, because that issue needs to be got to grips with. So just uh, in conclusion, uh, there are many, many faces, uh, crises facing the agri-food and far the farming industry. Uh, there needs to be action on these issues, the, 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 the access to, to labour, which is absolutely crucial, and the shortage of, C of CO2, because if these issues aren't acted on immediately, then we will see a situation where uh, an industry, the, our agri-food industry, which is already under severe pressure, will be absolutely uh, crippled. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, this House will be very familiar with complaints about the Holy Land area of South Belfast, the all-night partying, the um, risk of spreading COVID and the dumping in the alleyways. But, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I have been made aware overnight there that there was a young woman was followed home. Um, I've seen the footage of her front door having been kicked in by a man. This morning there were two women were harassed, one, sorry, two females, one of them was a schoolgirl. Um, and it was only through the intervention of a resident who we both have had correspondence from uh, that the man ran off. Um, I am so concerned about this area. It is becoming a lawless slum. And the interventions from the public services, whether it's the police, um, Belfast City Council, the housing executive um, or the universities themselves, they really are going to have to stop passing the buck, stop putting, on pe pe putting in piecemeal interventions for short periods of time because we are now getting to the stage where young girls can't even walk to school without being harassed. What would have happened if that kind, heroic gentleman hadn't have intervened? And I would declare an interest. I've just left my daughter this weekend off to Newcastle, a strange city. We send our children to these places around GB and down south and further afield, knowing and hoping that they will be safe. And the last thing we need to do is now have harassing of our young female students when they're just minding their own business, going, um, try, trying to live their lives. So I just want to put on record, I am meeting with the police next week, but I will be raising serious concerns with the universities around this today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. I want to take a few moments to congratulate the Ulster Scots Agency and the various Lambeg Drum Drumming Associations for the magnificent and inventive display that they put on at the weekend in front of Parliament buildings uh, in order to celebrate our neglected centenary. And of course, it was fitting that such a tribute was paid in, Parliament, uh, in the grounds of Parliament buildings because of the churlish, bigoted refusal, courtesy of Sinn Féin, uh, through the Assembly Commission, to allow even a centenary stone to mark that centenary. Even a rose bush couldn't overcome the bigotry of Sinn Féin. So I am delighted that on uh, Saturday we had that display, loud and proud, to celebrate the centenary of this great place we call Northern Ireland. Well done to them. Mr Mervyn Sorry. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, and I concur with the comments of my colleague uh, from North Antrim, Mr Allister, on, on what was uh, a magnificent display outside these buildings, uh, and also the words of my other colleague in North Antrim sending our best wishes to the Northern Ireland ladies football team, our national ladies team, and we wish them well for tonight. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, today is World Autism Day, and later on the Health Minister will join with the Alzheimer's Society of Northern Ireland and will uh, commemorate uh, that particular day. Sadly, it is in the context that our care home residents have accounted for some 51 per cent of all COVID-19 related deaths, compared to 50 per cent in Scotland, 39 per cent in England and 34 per cent in Wales. And of course, the statistics have confirmed that over a third of all deaths in Northern Ireland relating to the virus were people with dementia. It is in that context, therefore, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, that with sadness uh, I uh, pay uh, attention to the decision to close the court care nursing home in Ballymoney. 
RQIA have withdrawn the registration for that particular facility, and it has caused uh, untold alarm and concern to the staff, to the families, and particularly to the residents of the court care home that this situation has arisen. I want to pay tribute to the staff of the home for the care, because this decision is in no reflection of the care that has been provided in that particular facility. It is, however, a telling reflection of the way in which the place was being managed when in the notice decision issued by the RQIA, and can I place on record my appreciation to the Chief Executive of the RQIA, to the Chief Executive of the Northern Trust and to their staff for the conversations that we've had with them over the last number of days. But there has been an issue raised in the notice of decision where the current registered provider uh, raised concerns with RQIA, RQIA by way of an email and in a meeting in July about the integrity of the new applicant RI and the financial arrangement underpinning the application, specifically a scheme known as Invest in Rooms. It seems as though we had a situation when RQIA conducted some further uh, research that this issue has been uh, ongoing for some time. So therefore, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, I want today to ask that the Health Minister and everyone concerned does all to ensure that this issue is investigated and that the care of the residents of the care nursing home are provided for. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal. I'd like to take this opportunity today to highlight the damning response to the SDLP's recent education survey, which asked parents for their honest appraisal of the impact of the pandemic uh, on their children's education, mental health and the support they have received. The results published uh, today paint a frightening picture uh, of parents' experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic and the complete dereliction of duty from successive education ministers and their departments throughout this uh, challenging time. Of the 708 parents who responded to the survey, the vast majority felt their ch child had missed out on learning and believed this has impacted on their life opportunities. Perhaps most worryingly, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, of all, 72% of parents felt their child's mental health had deteriorated during the pandemic, and a total of 95% felt the Department of Education had handled the pandemic badly or could have done better. These results spell out the despair many parents felt as they tried to juggle working from home and educating their children while receiving totally inadequate support. It also shows the total lack of faith people have in the department responsible for ed educating our children here in Northern Ireland. It's not just their education. Our children's mental health is at stake as we emerge from this pandemic and return to some form of normality. We need to see proper support mechanisms in place for pupils as they readjust to school and life in general in, com in the coming months. We have had a problem with uh, uh, inadequate mental health support for our young people long before the pandemic and can't afford uh, to ignore this challenge any longer. Our young people were kept indoors for long periods of time, away from friends and family, at crucial stages of their development. This will have long-lasting consequences which will become more apparent in the years ahead. The after-effects of the pandemic will cast a long shadow, and we cannot allow our children to become casualties of this pandemic. No child should have their education or prospects limited as a result of matters entirely outside of their control. We need to ensure a level playing field for those affected and ensure that our young people are afforded the same opportunities as uh, the previous generation. Even now that our children have returned to schools, it's been nothing but chaos, Mr. Prince of Deputy Speaker. And school leaders have been speaking out about poor planning from the Education Minister and the Department, from the Education Authority. Uh, their actions since the beginning of term have uh, typified the reasons for parents' lack of faith in the education system at present. These findings place the onus on the Minister to come up with a plan to alleviate parents' fears and address the issues raised as a result of disrupted learning during this pandemic. Given the actions as of late, parents could be forgiven for struggling to believe that such solutions will be forthcoming. 
I have yet to see a detailed plan from the Minister for Education that will address the education deficit the parents are telling us exists uh, for many children who weren't able to engage in online learning. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll conclude where the Education Minister has demonstrated a stunning dereliction of duty, we will step up and where we will see these results inform our policy, take them on board and take up with a concrete plan that restores parents' faith in our education system while ensuring that our children get the learning experience that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Terry Carroll. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I want to briefly pay tribute to uh, Adol Finnegan, uh, community and support stalwart, uh, former Antrim captain who uh, passed away sadly the weekend. Uh, I remember um, some of you in West Belfast and give my thoughts to his family and, and former teammates um, on his passing. Mr. Speaker, I also uh, uh, raised to speak about the disgraceful decision to reintroduce car parking charges for health workers, which is causing fury amongst all our health workers who sacrificed so much for every, every one of us during the pandemic. Supposedly, after COVID, we were to learn the lessons, but seemingly the minister and the executive on the whole hasn't got the memo. Not satisfied with plan ahead with a blow, below inflation pay offer, that falls way short of what health workers deserve and have demanded themselves. We now have another charge lumped onto health workers at a time when they, like all working class people, are really feeling the financial squeeze. The reality for health workers is now universal credit cut national insurance contributions on the rise and now being charged to park outside their place of work. So we're talking about people here uh, going to work in ICU wards, treating cancer patients, maternity nurses, and the list goes on and on. Historically, we had the disgraceful decision that allowed private companies to charge millions to health workers to park at their place of work, and now the department and the trusts are following in that vein. Before the exemption, uh, for parking charges came into place. It was people at hospitals who were forced to pay, including obviously health workers. But this new proposal from the Minister and the Department will see health and wellbeing centres and those within them being forced to pay to park outside. What message does this send to our OTs, mental health workers and those who work in these important and vital facilities? And it is shocking already as things exist. You or your loved ones may be forced to go to a &E services, but also be hit with a £12 charge uh, or more. Not only is this unfair and unjust, these charges, but it is also one that could be counterproductive and discourage people from going to seek out medical advice and assistance at a time when they are told to do so. Workers, Mr Deputy Speaker, should not be forced to pay for the planning disasters around our city, a lack of free and timely uh, public transport and so on. That is a political failure. And we always hear, um, and we have heard it in the last number of days, we can't afford this, uh, the cost is too much. I mean, the, the trusts spend over £100 million every single year on agency staff, so the money is clearly there. Uh, so if supporting health workers is a priority for this executive, then it must ensure that not only are health workers pay at a proper wage, but they aren't forced to pay to park outside their place of work. Thank you. Thank you, members. I've got three members left on the list and roughly seven minutes, so you know, chop, chop. Um, Mrs Dolores Kelly. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I will endeavour to, to uh, be generous with time. I, I, I rise because of the number of constituents who have contacted my office in dire straits and, and with deep anxiety, not only on their own behalf, but on behalf of a family member in relation to accessing uh, health and social care. Uh, I think we have heard a lot of talk, quite rightly, around the challenging figures that continue to rise around COVID infection and the impact of the pandemic. But not enough, I feel, is being said in relation to the impact of uh, persons being unable to access the vital health care that they need should their condition be red flagged. For example, um, um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I had one constituent who is still awaiting um, their breast cancer review. A very anxious time for any person. And I have another in severe and crippling pain, a person who's worked all their lives, who has now been told uh, through me that they have to wait over 52 weeks for their initial appointment in order to uh, access uh, painkillers. And they then tried uh, to um, access it in a private way. £150, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, they were told for a phone call with a consultant, and they wouldn't get that phone call to November. So my uh, uh, concern also extends to the parents of children who have had to be assessed by Zoom for autism and for all sorts of, of uh, 
uh, mental health challenges as well. Um, I, I don't think it's good enough. I don't think we have uh, any COVID recovery in place or how to deal with non-elective or elective surgery right across the north. So I, my plea is that the First and Deputy First Minister and the whole executive indeed with the Health Minister uh, quickly set out a plan of recovery for the health and social care system, not only in dealing with the challenge in COVID, but on the uh, waiting list, which is a shame and a disgrace right across these islands. Mr. Malisha McHugh. Uh, I'll go straight to the point. I'll call on the Minister for Infrastructure to direct her staff in the West Zone area to immediately implement safety measures, including accident black spot signs and rumble bars on the approach road to the Bells Park Road at the Prospect Bar near the Glebe outside of Straban. Now, this possibly is the most dangerous junction in Ireland. Since 2011, I have highlighted the dangers of this junction, and whilst measures such as improved signage and site clearances have been implemented, accidents continue to happen. And because of their frequency, this junction has moved up the list of priorities for the road service for a major works programme. Now, last Sunday, when returning from Dublin, I received a phone call. Another accident at the Prospect, where a vehicle had driven through the junction colliding with the vehicles on the main Bells Park Road. And unbelievably, on Friday morning, a similar call in exactly the same circumstances. And it's incredulous to actually hear that on Sunday evening, I received another call. And once again, the same circumstances where a vehicle had driven straight through the junction and crashed with those on the main Bells Park Road. Three accidents in exactly the same circumstances, all within one week. Now, this has to stop. Wastely year. Thanks be to God, no one has lost their lives, but there's been, I'm sure, uncountable damage both to vehicles and human beings at that particular junction. This has to stop. We can't wait for the major project to come to fruition. Measures need to be implemented now, and I implore on the Minister to act immediately to implement safety measures on the approach roads to the main Bells Park Road. For example, the accident black spot signs and rumble bars to alert motorists of the dangers of this junction, and in particular, to protect lives. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I very briefly want to raise the, the ongoing urgent issue of COVID safety in our, our schools. It is obviously the priority of us all to maximise safety and attendance of children in school, but there is an ongoing genuine concern at the new approach to pupil testing, tracing and isolation in our schools. Uh, the redefinition of what constitutes a pupil close contact has been ill-explained uh, and poorly implemented. Uh, in our schools by Minister of Education, Minister of Health, CMO and PHA uh, to the extent where I'm hearing of reports of contact tracing by WhatsApp. Um, there are concerns with regards to a lack of clarity regarding what constitutes a cluster, a concern for clinically extremely vulnerable children and indeed reports of the EA rapid response deep cleaning team being stood down. Um, rather than build confidence in this new approach to COVID safety in our schools, I listened to a PHA official patronise an experienced school leader about these concerns. Uh, I'm grateful that the Education Committee has proposed a joint meeting with the Health Committee uh, for the Education Minister, Health Minister, CMO and PHA to communicate clearly on these matters. Um, I welcome that the Education Minister, I believe the CMO and PHA have accepted uh, this invitation to an extent and will be attending the Education Committee tomorrow. Principal Deputy Speaker, in closing, it is incumbent on us all to heed these concerns and to ensure that a robust pupil test trace and isolation system is fit to protect the safety and attendance of our children in school. Thank you. Thank you. He has been rising in his position from the start of this, so I think it would only be fair, even though, strictly speaking, we are out of time. But Mr Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I really do appreciate that. Um, I just want to raise the issue with the House about the temporary closure of Northfield House Rehabilitation Centre in Donegal, which is run by the South Eastern Trust. 
Um, this is a, a rather, developing, a rather uh, worrying development uh, about Northfield House as there have been previous attempts to close it permanently by the South Eastern Trust. Um, what is disturbing is that COVID uh, was used as the reason for the temporary closure of the facility, where 19 staff were written to and told that uh, Northfield House was to close as Northfield House was to be used for the recovery of COVID patients. And all the patients that were in the facility were removed and sent home, some without care packages, I have to say, which is an absolute disgrace. Uh, those staff then waited for several weeks for COVID patients to come for rehabilitation. And not one COVID patient was sent to that facility. Then uh, several weeks later, the same staff got a letter to say that Northfield House was being closed on a temporary basis. Now, what concerns me is that we hear about uh, our hospitals overfilling, uh, the serious nature of our ICUs and, and the COVID patients, and yet here we are closing a facility uh, that was occupied up to 81% before COVID. So I do believe, and, and I would send a, a warning to other members, to watch out in your trust that they don't use uh, COVID as an issue to try and close potential units. Um, and I would be sending a message to the Health Minister today that the people of Donaghy do not accept this being closed on a temporary basis. We need every bed that we can get uh, right across our health service, and I hope members uh, can support me in the ongoing battle to try and reopen that facility. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker.